Pilgrims and Penguins. The next three after that is the Methodists, and then the last three were some old ourselves. But there'll be a wee leaflet uh, to let you know who's preaching in the mornings and, uh, and, and, and who's preaching in the evenings and where that will be. So next Sunday night I'll be preaching, uh, but I'll be preaching at St. Brendan's. Uh, in the summer too, we're going to go through the parables uh, in St. Luke. It's gospel. Well, I start that all over again. What do you think? <laughs> oh, I could be a treat for me to start it all over, wouldn't it, Jim? You would love me to start it all over again. It's a pity there's anything on at the end of the service because we could have done the service all over again, uh, just to make sure. So, so this is the last week in in in, in Strand for six weeks. Uh, for the next three weeks, it'll be uh, in the evening. It will be in St Brendan's, and then the three weeks after that, Methodist, and then ourselves. But there will be a wee leaflet out next Sunday morning. Uh, just to let you know and and where that will be, just to keep yourselves right. So it's lovely to see you. We'll sing, be still, for the presence of the Lord is here. Let's stand as we worship. Let's all pray. Father, we do thank you for being with us this day. Uh, We thank you that as we've been singing already and as we've been praying and listening to your word, we have not been disappointed. Your Holy Spirit has taken opportunity to speak to us. And tonight, Lord, as we come again, we want to be still, recognizing, Lord, that what makes your presence real to us is not the worship or the crowds or or the building or the preacher. What makes your presence real to us is your Holy Spirit coming down to speak to us, to minister to us, and to make us more like you. And so, Lord, at the very beginning of this new week, as we look forward to all that might happen, uh, we dedicate this hour in your name. Lead us and guide us, we ask. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll continue our study of, of David's life. And as I said, we'll have a wee break over the summer and then come September, uh, we'll finish it off. We're going to read from 1 Samuel. It's chapter 18. And it's just after he has killed Goliath, uh, the giant. This is God's word. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him 
It did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Whatever Saul sent him to do, David did so successfully that Saul gave him a high rank in the army. This pleased all the people and Saul's officers as well. When David was returning home after when, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with tambourines and lutes. As they danced, they sang. Saul has slayed his thousands, but David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain galled him. They have credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but me with only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a jealous eye on David. The next day, an evil spirit from God came forcibly upon Saul. He was prophesying in his house while David was playing the harp, as he usually did. Saul had a spear in his hand, and he hurled it, saying to himself, I'll pin David to the wall. But David eluded him twice. Amen. We're going to sing again, and it's a song that we know ever so well. It's at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Let's stand as we worship.
It's just as well, really, that God doesn't tell us what's ahead of us. Thankfully, we don't know what's going to happen this week or next month or next year or over the next five years. Thankfully, we don't know that. Very often, we would love to know it and uh, we'd love to know well, what's going to happen uh, over this week and what's going to hope happen over the next month or what, 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 what does my future hold over the next four or five years? And we would think that if we knew about it, then we wouldn't have to worry about it. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the case. Certainly for David, David had no idea whenever he went with the food for his brothers, what would happen. He had no idea that that one event, killing Goliath, would change his life completely forever. His life would not be the same. He had no idea that would happen, and maybe just as well. Not only that, we, we know that, that, that uh, Samuel anointed him uh, a number of months before this event. And then he went and he killed Goliath. And you would think then, the next event that was going to take place is that David becomes the king of Israel. That David would be the youngest king that ever lived uh, uh, in, in Israel. You would have thought that would be the sequence. That would be the natural sequence, but that wasn't the sequence at all. He was anointed in, in, at home in Bethlehem. He then fought the giant Goliath. And then over the next few years, he's an outcast. He's an outlaw. He's someone who is despised by Saul himself. And he has to make sure that he's not caught by Saul over the next few years because Saul is out to get him. So thankfully for David, he didn't know what was going to happen. But we noticed with David's life, and we, we, we noticed it when he was anointed and, and with, with the, the giant, he trusted God. And he was willing to trust God each day as he followed God. That's why it says that David had the heart of God in that sense that he, he knew that God was looking after him. And therefore, whether he was a shepherd boy or whether he was uh, the, the great soldier who killed Goliath, or whether he was an outlaw, or whether he was the king, he continued to trust God. And in trusting God that he found grace. In trusting God he found his strength to cope with every trial and difficulty uh, in his life. And so for a moment tonight, I want to look at this, this passage. Really, is, it covers the next two or three chapters, actually. And we're going to look at uh, four different types of relationships. Uh, that David had. And as you know yourself in your life, you have all sorts of relationships in your life. Some relationships you have are good relationships and there's other relationships that you have that are, are not so good. Uh, I remember when I first joined, I was in the post office and I was a counter clerk uh, and our boss was this lady who was an absolute nightmare. And I used to dread going into work because she just, oh, she was, she was an awful woman and nobody liked her. And, uh, but thankfully that was not the only relationship uh, that I had. Uh, that was one relationship that I dreaded and that I didn't enjoy. And, uh, but it was a relationship that I had amongst many. So here's four relationships uh, that David had. We're going to look at the relationship of submission uh, as he was under the control, under the authority of Saul. Uh, we'll look at the relationship of affection as he, as he had a great relationship with Jonathan, uh, Saul's son. We're going to look at the, the relationship of exaltation where the people of Israel recognized who David was and, and, and they wanted to place him where he thought he should be and, and they, they were singing praises to him and they thought he was wonderful. In this short passage, uh, we're going to look at the, the relationship of opposition that he had with Saul, how Saul uh, although he has authority over him, Saul hates him, and he hates him for all the wrong reasons. And, and we, there's a number of things that we can learn uh, from these different relationships. We all have lots of different relationships. Let's look at these four different types of relationship that David had at this particular time uh, in his life. First of all, the relationship of submission uh, with Saul. First of all, we notice that, that David goes out and he fights the giant and uh, he's confident as he fights the giant because he sees that he's defeated already in the eyes of God. And so the giant is slain, and as soon as the giant is slain, then the Philistine army run away. 
And, uh, and rather than letting them run away, what happened was the Israelites then came and they chased them. Uh, and as they chased them, they killed them. And the Philistine army was, was destroyed. It's not the only time that it was destroyed. Uh, and it will not be the last time that there is another event later on in his life we'll look at in David's life where, where they're, after that battle, then they're destroyed for many, many years. And they never have become a great force. Uh, to play in, in Israel's uh, neighborhood battles that they have with all the other neighbors. After that other event, that other battle, then they're really destroyed for good. They should never have been a strong nation anyway. Uh, they're a seafaring people, uh, and really their strength was actually out in the sea. Their strength was never in the land. But because Israel was so disjointed at this time, then that's why they were able to go in and, and conquer Israel so easily. It wasn't that the Philistines were strong, it was the fact that the Israelites were so weak. And so the, the, the Philistines are chased, and the people of Israel give chase, and they destroy uh, the army. And Saul then says to David, David, you'll no longer go home. You will serve with me in my army. His relationship changes with David. Remember that he went now and again and played for Saul. Uh, but now the relationship is that he is the king and David is a member of his army, a high-ranking officer in the army, but an army officer at the age of less than 20. He would have killed Goliath when he was less than 20 years old. And Saul then has, has complete command over David, and he keeps David close to him. It means then that, uh, that David is not able to go back to the father's house. He's not able to look after the sheep anymore. That relationship that he had with his father and, and, and his brothers changes dramatically uh, because of the death of, of Goliath. And here now, Saul is his commanding officer, and Saul is the one who determines uh, where David's life should go from now on. And David takes it in his stride. David, who is close to God, recognizes that, that there's nothing about this life that is permanent, and therefore he's willing to serve uh, Saul in this army capacity. He's willing to serve him and leave his old life behind. And surely that's something for us to recognize that life is always changing. And, and we are, our main thing in our life is we want to serve the king. And no matter where we do that, it's not important. It's the fact that we do it that's important. So whether the Lord asks us to serve here in, in, in Sydenham, or whether he calls us to, to be missionaries elsewhere, or he calls us to do things elsewhere, and then of course we should never say, well, I'm too young to go, or I'm too old to go. And uh, if the Lord calls us to serve him, we need to be willing to go and serve, because the relationship that counts is our relationship with the Lord. He is our commanding officer. He is the one who determines where we should go. And, and all our relationships may change, but he is the one who looks after us. But he's also the one who commands us uh, to serve. Interesting that this young man, who is not even able to fight uh, in the army. Remember, whenever he comes, the brothers despise him and say, look, what are you doing here? You're only here to do your nosy. And now he's a high-ranking officer. And it tells us here, and it tells us actually six different times in, in, in chapter 18 and 19, that the people are delighted that he's a high-ranking officer. The officers are delighted, and the people, the, the, the soldiers, are also delighted. In other words, they hold great respect for David. So it must be in what David says and what David does, they're able to say, here's somebody who knows what he's talking about. Here's somebody who is able to lead us and guide us, and we trust him. And that tells us something of David's character, that uh, as he is submissive to Saul, that others within the army are very quick to accept him. There's no more mention in, in, in the Bible from now on is that not David the shepherd boy? Is that not David the wee fella? No, they all recognize who he is and they follow his commands. Interesting too, from now on, uh, there's no other mention of his brothers uh, and how they despised him or, or how they looked down on him. He is now given that position of power and of prestige, but he's under submission of Saul. So that's the first relationship uh, that we notice in this passage that, that Saul says to him, and I want you to serve me full time. And I want you to stay with me and not go back home. The second relationship is a relationship of affection. And very, very quickly, 
he becomes good friends with Jonathan, an intimate friend with Jonathan, actually. Jonathan is the heir, uh, elect. Jonathan is the older son uh, of King Saul, and therefore he's going to be the natural next king. And, uh, and therefore, the, the, the clothes that he wears and the armor that he wears is the best. And here it tells us here that, that David and Solomon are very, very close. So close that, 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 Saul, or, or, sorry, Jonathan, that Jonathan gives his armor and his clothes uh, to David as a sign that they are equal, a sign that he recognizes that he is equal. And of course, friendships are so important. What we find in this relationship, we'll look at later on, uh, but this friendship is very, very deep and intimate and, and a very important friendship. And unfortunately, has a very sad ending uh, because of Saul. But it's a, it's a friendship that lasts until Jonathan's death. And I think there's four things it tells us about this relationship uh, and this friendship. First of all, in, in a really good friendship, an intimate friendship, there's always a willingness to sacrifice. Saul does, or Jonathan doesn't try to protect his position. Jonathan doesn't try to say, well, listen, this is what he did, and therefore I need to recognize that he may be seen as the next king. And I have to defend where I am, not at all. What he does, he gives him his, his best tunic, and he gives him his sword, and he gives him his, his weapons. And what he's actually saying is, I see us as equal. And because of that then, then David could easily be the next king. Jonathan is willing to sacrifice his position because of their friendship. And you know yourself, whenever you've had a friend who's a good friend, an intimate friend, you're always willing to do things for them. You're always willing to help them. And it's not a case of, of, of uh, I helped you this time, you help me next time. But it is a case of, of if you're able to help a friend in tall, then you do it and you never count how many times they've helped you or how many times you, you help them. But it's, it's an intimate friendship. It's what we are called as Christians, actually, to have, not only with the Lord, but with fellow Christians. The second thing we notice about this friendship is the friendship is loyal, uh, even when the other person has been attacked by others. Later on in this story, we hadn't time to read it, but later on, Saul is fuming against David, and he's plotting to kill him. And Jonathan stands up and he says, wait a minute, Father, what are you talking about? Why do you want to kill David? You have no good reason to kill David. David hasn't done anything against you. The only reason you want to kill David is because you're jealous of him. Because of what the women were saying and because of what David has done. You're jealous and that's why you want to kill him. And so as others are speaking against David, then Jonathan is very quick to stand up in loyal defense of his friend. And I think that's really important in friendship too, isn't it? That when people speak against uh, your friend, it is important, your friends, it's always important to jump to their defense. And you know, we need to make sure that we're able to do that. Very often uh, in the, um, down in the Odyssey there, people would say, you know, Christians are hypocrites. I know someone and they're a terrible hypocrite. Then as, as a Christian, I cannot jump to that person's defense because I don't know who they are, and so I try to move the conversation away from that. But when you do know someone, if someone says something about someone else in church, we as Christians, we should stand for their defense. We say, well, actually, in, the, in, in my case, that is not the case. Or, or I've never seen that person say that or do that or go there. And uh, we must be willing, uh, and a very good friend in, in Mark Hill, he was a clerk of session, but he was a very, very quiet man. And if folk spoke about other folk, Edwin's policy was not to get involved. And I remember saying to him quite a few times, I says, Edwin, that's wrong. That's wrong. If someone speaks about another elder, and you know that's not true, then you must speak out and say, I'm sorry, but that's not true. Oh, but Danny, Danny, I don't want to get involved. I don't want to take sides. I said, Edwin, it's got nothing to do with taking sides. It's to do with speaking the truth and defending one another. And so if we know within Kirk Session something happens and someone says something else happens, it's your duty to correct those folk and to speak out. And as, as Christians, we must do that with one another. We must not say, well, actually, I'm not getting involved or, or, or I'm, I'm, I'm not speaking out at this time. 
It's important that as Christians that we do speak out for the truth and we speak out for one another. The third thing we notice about this friendship is that friends will always allow themselves to be themselves to one another. In other words, we don't have to put a show, and that's the great thing I think about being Christians, we don't have to put on a show about who we are. There was a chap in Market Hill and, and he became a minister. Uh, he's a minister now in, in a place in, in Lurgan. And, uh, and when he spoke to you, he spoke normally. But as soon as he went in the pulpit, he had a very posh voice. And I thought, I need to say to him about that. And, uh, and so I said to him about that and he says, Danny, I'm not realising I'm doing it. I said, well, David, you are. And I said, if, if you do that what, that, that, what that comes over as is that you're a different person in the pulpit than they are, you know, in the pew. And you mustn't be like that. You must be exactly the same. And, and you mustn't try to be a minister. What you need to do is be yourself. And therefore, because positions are not important. So somebody might say, well, I was very high up in the civil service, you know. Or I worked in the gas board. Or, or, or whatever it might be. I don't know if anybody who works in the gas Well, nobody worked in the gas board, to be honest. Maybe got paid by the gas board, but I'm not sure. <laughs> but, you know, very often we, 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 we have a persona of the position that we think that we have. And, and, and true friendship is not like that, actually. And so within the church, as we're the family of God, we need to be ourselves. And we need to allow others or we need to be themselves, you know. We need to allow others that, to be different from us. And yet we love them just the same. And the, th and the fourth thing about friendship, this friendship with Jonathan, is they were always a constant uh, a source of encouragement for one another. In chapter 19, David has to flee from Saul. Saul is one to come here in this chapter we read of how at one point he gets a spear and he throws it at David. His anger is so enraged against David. Well, it gets even worse in chapter 19. David has to flee. And over the next few years, David is like an outlaw. He, he hides in caves and he hides in the desert and he hides in the wilderness because Saul is after to kill him. And at one particular case in, in chapter 19, Saul is enraged and he goes with, with his elite force to kill David. He doesn't know where he is, but he knows he's in the wilderness somewhere. And Jonathan knows exactly where he is. And so Jonathan goes to David. And the Bible tells us that, that Jonathan was such an encouragement to David in the wilderness. And we need to encourage one another. As friends, it's important that we're a source of encouragement one to the other. Uh, we live in a world that doesn't encourage Christians. Uh, I remember, I mentioned to you before, of, of if you were a Christian in West uh, Australia, the moderator of the Presbyterian Church in Western Australia came over to the General Assembly maybe five, six years ago. And he said, where I am, if you say that you're a Christian, it would be the same as saying that you're a pedophile. The people are against you for being a Christian. And, and we were aghast. But I think actually it's almost getting like that in Northern Ireland. And when you say you're a Christian, there was a time when people thought, oh, that means you're upright. That means you're honest. That means you're kind. Whereas actually people now, whenever you say you're a Christian, oh, you're judgmental. And uh, you're against this and you're against that and you're against the next thing. And it's getting to the stage actually, I think, in Belfast, where being a Christian is something that is seen as negative and not as positive anymore. There was a time when it was a very positive thing to be a Christian. Whereas I think actually in Belfast now is quite a negative thing uh, to be a Christian. I'm not sure if that's the case still in the country, but I do think in Belfast that it's, it's a negative thing uh, if, if you're a Christian. And therefore we need all the encouragement we can from our Christian friends. We need to encourage one another and love one another as Jonathan loved David and as David loved Jonathan. So in a relationship of submission with Saul, in a relationship of affection with Jonathan, in a relationship of exaltation, uh, with the people of Israel. They were amazed at what took place. I think I said before last week that when David came down off the hill to fight Goliath, the Philistines would have been all excited. Look who they've put. You know, he's puny, he's small. It'd be no use against our giant Goliath. And the people of Israel, as David came down, they wouldn't have been cheering David on. 
They must have a pit in their hearts. The only thing they were glad of is it wasn't them. And then David beats him. Against all odds, David beats him. And beats him well. One throw of the stone and he's dead. Amazing. And then David not only kills him, he cuts off his head. And not only does he that, then he runs to attack the Philistines. David doesn't do that and sit down for a smoke. He does it and then he runs to attack the Philistines. And as he runs to attack the Philistines, the people of Israel come and they run. He is a hero to them. And he's a hero not only because he killed Goliath, he's a hero in the way that he lives his life. That's what I'm saying. The people, whenever he was made this, this high-ranking official, they were all very happy because they could see something in David. He was wise, he was sincere, and he worked hard. They could see that in him, and therefore they exalted him. Isn't it good when people think well of us for the things that we do? We don't do good things so that people might think well of us. We do good things so that people might see Christ in us. And if that means they think well of us, that's a good thing because it then gives us an opportunity to witness and to speak. We teach English here on a Saturday morning. And one of the reasons we teach English here is, is not only to help people learn English, but also so that they think well of us. We want them to think well of us so that when we share with them the gospel of Christ, they listen. Because when they first come in through the door, they're strangers to us. They don't know us at all. They are strangers in a strange land. And we put our hand of friendship. And not only do we show friendship uh, in what we say, we show friendship in how we teach English. And we do that so they think well of us, so that we have opportunity to share and to speak of the things of God. And so there's nothing wrong with doing good things that the folk may think well of us, as long as we recognize that that glory always goes to God. And we do it for the reason of having an opportunity to share the gospel. We don't do it so that one day we might get an OBE or an MBE. We had a man in Market Hill, he died about a year and a half ago. And he got an MBE from the Queen. And boy, he was pleased. I remember the very first time I went to visit. Oh, Reverend Rankin, lovely to see you. Now, I'm not like one of these other men. I don't boast about the things that I've got. There's your man. He mentioned another man in the town who got an MBE. I'm not like him. He's always boasting. I knew this man really well. And he'd never, ever, ever mentioned to me that I had an MBE. Never mentioned. He got it actually through the army uh, for some of the things he did. And uh, he never mentioned to me, but Noel did. And, uh, or sorry, Robin. Robin did. Robin, that was there. Uh, Robin said, oh, that, uh, my Reverend Rankin, this is, this is what I got. Uh, would you like to see the video? And he gave me the video and my heart sank. Because it meant I had to go home and watch it. Because I knew I had to take it back. And when I took it back, I had to tell him what I saw. And every time we had something special. Now, it might be fair day, or it might have been uh, sort of uh, St. Patrick's Day, and there was maybe something happening in the town. Any day that he thought was special, he would have worn the medal and walked up and down Market Hill. He was proud to have the MBE. And it's because he raised so many thousands for good charities in the South Armagh area. And, uh, and he was never done telling you how much money he raised. And we have not to be like that. We have to help people, we have to be good to people, so that people might think well of us, so that we might have an opportunity to share the gospel. And so he had a, a relationship of exaltation uh, with the people, that they recognized who he was. And that angered Saul even more. And finally then, he had a relationship of opposition against Saul. Saul was opposed to him for no good reason. David never spoke against him. In fact, whenever, well, later on in the story we'll know that whenever they died and, uh, and the heads are brought to David, David has the men executed uh, for chopping off the head of Saul and Jonathan. But David never speaks against the King Saul because he sees King Saul as God's anointed. Even though God had given up in David, or given up in Saul. David would never give up in Saul. And so the opposition was unfair. And as a church, we will be opposed. We will be opposed by government, we'll be opposed by, by our neighbors at times. They will not understand what we're doing. And that opposition will be unfair. 
that's okay, because that's what happened with Jesus, and that's certainly what happened with David in this story. That Saul is opposed to him for all the wrong reasons of jealousy, uh, of, of anger. When it says he was very angry, it was it's a sense of, of a burning coal within his heart. Uh, it, it burned within him, the anger, and he was seething in his anger uh, against David. And it's because David always did the right thing. So here in this story, great story of David and Goliath, but for the next number of years, he's in these different types of relationships and really difficult relationships. Each one of them is a difficult relationship. He's submissive to Saul and yet, yet he's in opposition to Saul. He's, he's got a relationship of affection with Jonathan, but Jonathan is, a, is, the, is King Saul's son. The people want to make him king, but he doesn't want to become king at this stage because Israel already has a king and he will not oppose King Saul. Now we notice in, in Israel's history that there were always these plans to depose the king, but David never had a plan to depose the king. So although the people wanted to make David king, David did not want to become king because King Saul was already on the throne. And therefore, in our lives, we have no idea what our future holds. And we have all sorts of relationships with people. But we need to make sure that we're not like Saul. We need to make sure we're more like David and Jonathan. We need to make sure that the relationships we have with people are wholesome. And there'll be relationships that people will have with us that we have no control over. And we need to recognize that. But as we remain faithful to God, God will always, will always have the glory. Let's pray together. Father, again, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that as we read your word, we recognize that we are very complex people. We have all sorts of different relationships with different people. And we might even have different relationships with the same person as, as David had here, in that relationship of submission to Saul, and yet the relationship where Saul was opposing him at that very same time. But we thank you, Lord, that David's relationship with you never changed. And that's because of who you are. And we recognize, Lord, that as a church and as individuals, we have lots of different relationships with one another and with the world around us. Some of those relationships are healthy and some of those relationships are difficult. But help us through it all to be like David. David was known to be wise and sensitive. Help us to be wise and sensitive. Help us to do the right thing and say the right thing. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's come before God as we give to God our evening offerings. Our final hymn is a hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. As we are reminded of who God is and our relationship with Him, it will not change as we remain close to Him. Let's stand as we worship.
and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one of us now and for always. Amen.